There was no shortage of lofty ideas on the Democratic debate stage, to put it mildly. Gun confiscation, banning private health insurance, covering illegal immigrants' health care with your taxpayer dollars. And all of this explained to us in broken entry-level Spanish, no less. One of the loftiest ideas that hardly even came up at all in round one, however, is the concept of reparations for slavery, an idea for which most of these candidates are on record with varying degrees of support, an idea also recently discussed with a dedicated hearing in the House. The frustrating thing about nearly all of these candidates is they offer tacit support without explaining specifics, and when asked to explain, they just punt to generics like, I think it's time for a conversation, or I think we should study the issue. I firmly support Congresswoman Jackson Lee's bill to create a commission to study reparations. We need to study the effects of generations of discrimination and institutional racism. Appoint a congressional panel to, of experts, of people who are studying this, who talk about different ways we may be able to do it. Okay, cool. So before we throw out a bunch of cash to the special skin tones, we'll throw out a bunch more cash studying the effects of doing so, because no government waste Sunday is complete without a wasteful BS academic cherry on top. All these candidates are saying is I want the pander points without the actual liability. There is one exception to the cop-out club, however. One candidate with the balls, or at least the spiritual orbs, to state her support unequivocally and to offer an actual plan. That's Marianne Williamson, meme hero of the first debate, who has had a plan on the table since at least January, $100 billion in reparations to be distributed over 10 years by a council of black leaders. On her Rubin appearance, I'll discuss momentarily, it sounds like she's revised that plan to $200 billion, $10 billion a year to be distributed over 20, so I guess it's a flexible plan, but at least it's still a plan, something we can vet and scrutinize and debate not just defer to some abstract conversation that's never going to happen based on some academic study with predetermined conclusions that'll cost us millions of dollars to obtain. You may recall Marianne bringing up reparations is actually what prompted the famous Biden versus Harris busing moment. It was a finer point of the main debate highlight and a context that turned out to be somewhat fitting. It was Marianne voicing her support for reparations that gave Kamala Harris the reference point to weaponize her race and seize the debate. The Democratic Party should be on the side of reparations for slavery for this very reason. I do not believe, I do not believe that the average American is a racist, but the average American is woefully undereducated about the history of race in the United States. I, I Ms. Williamson, like thank, thank you very much. The Vice President Biden, Biden, I'm gonna, we're gonna get to you. Hang on, we're gonna get to you. On the stage, I would well, like to speak I, I, on the issue of race. <laughs> personal and I was actually very it was hurtful to hear you talk about the reputations of two United States senators who built their reputations and career on the segregation of race in this country. That exchange, in my mind, actually ironically illustrates several of the flaws in the concept of reparations. Kamala Harris got special treatment solely on the basis of her race. Per the debate rules, she was supposed to get 30 seconds. Instead, she took over three minutes in what seemed like unlimited time from the moderators to racially browbeat Joe Biden, a man with no personal relationship to racially oppressing others, just as Kamala Harris has no personal relationship to being racially oppressed. She's Indian and Jamaican. Her family owned slaves. They weren't enslaved. But because her skin color looks right, we give her special treatment and claim to call it justice, when in fact this scene was entirely unfair and based on no actual facts or coherent reasoning. It just feels good. And that's been my main problem with the concept of reparations up to this point. Few people supporting it are actually willing to discuss the idea on rational rather than emotional terms. It's just a supposed given that a good person supports it and a bad person doesn't, but that's not an actual argument. That's just moral browbeating, and it doesn't make for good or just policy. I need to hear two pieces of a proper argument. First, the philosophical justification. Why anybody owes money to somebody else today based on sins from generations ago that nobody even has personal connections to anymore? And second, after you've explained that philosophical basis, I need to hear how this is even achievable in practical terms. Who gets taxed? Who gets paid? How much? 
And how would we demonstrate a personal connection to slavery sufficient to even make these judgments? Marianne Williamson appeared on Dave Rubin's show discussing the issue at length, touching on both of those necessary components of the argument. And I appreciate that she did. She's the only one making the detailed case for us to consider. I want to understand the best reparations argument out there, not just dunk on the idea and laugh and go home. And as of now, Marianne Williamson is the only one offering it. So let's start with that philosophical basis, the why question before we can address the how. Marianne's case is built largely on the concept of historical institutional responsibility, not individual guilt. She speaks to the history of the country. Two and a half centuries of slavery, we're talking about abject slavery here, then another hundred years of institutionalized violence. What do you call lynchings if not domestic terror? What do you call Ku Klux Klan if not domestic terror? Institutionalized white supremacy and segregation, this was violent perpetrated against the people. 350 years, because it was a hundred years after the Civil War before the Civil Rights Act. 350 years of institutionalized violence against the people, that's longer than our country has been in existence. Isn't that really the problem, though? That is to say, how can a country take responsibility for something that extends beyond its existence? If slavery in the American context extends beyond the existence of the United States, then surely Britain and African slave traders must also be responsible. Why don't we have some type of international reconciliation effort? She argues that the U.S. actually took over for Britain, thus assuming their debts, like a business acquisition. If you have a a company that takes over another company, you inherit their assets and you inherit their debts. And so America inherited the debts. Except that wasn't the premise of the American Revolution. That wasn't the premise under which the United States was born. We fought for colonial independence under the premise that Britain was doing it wrong, that we wanted nothing to do with their debts. And that's why many states immediately abolished slavery upon Britain's defeat. Independence from Britain was the beginning of the end of slavery, not the continuation of a business model that we wanted to take over. I think it's just as credible to argue that the United States is institutionally responsible for abolition not perpetuated slavery. Regardless, Marianne's argument is built upon this concept of institutional or national responsibility, which she distinguishes from individual guilt. Obviously, nobody today is individually guilty of enslaving people. That's not what she's saying. Instead, she says that we institutionally bear that responsibility. Thus, this is an institutional problem to solve. Marianne even explains that she herself does not feel individually guilty for slavery or Jim Crow. It's a difference between taking guilt and responsibility. There's a difference. I don't believe that, you know, I personally, I, I didn't own slaves. That's not what we're talking about when you're talking about national atonement and national amends. There's no guilt there. I, don't, I can't say I feel guilty personally. Uh, that's not what's happening. But I can see that my country has, this is a long and torturous relationship between blacks and whites in America. But this argument never really gets sharpened, nor is it consistently applied. For example, she explains that in Germany, one of the benefits of Holocaust reparations has been the relief of guilt for present-day Germans. Because Germany has done the right thing, you feel in a generation of young Germans so much guilt flushed out. Holocaust guilt has been flushed out. That's what we're talking about. We're ending the guilt. We're talking about getting past this torturous uh, phase that's lasted for hundreds of right, years. But if the premise is that individual present-day Germans should have no guilt for the sins of the past, then absolving them of that guilt cannot be one of the benefits in your argument for reparations. You shouldn't feel guilty, but also doing this will absolve you of your guilt. That's incoherent. Another distinction Marianne draws is that between atonement and amends. Roughly, I think we can think of one of these as apology and the other as justice. There is atonement and there is amends. If you stole a thousand dollars from me and then you came up to me and said, I, Marianne, I am so sorry that I stole that thousand dollars from you. I would feel I really appreciate your apology, and I'd also like my cash back. So the idea of making an amends in addition to atonement is the way you truly close the circle of reconciliation. Right. And that's a fair distinction, I suppose, but the problems arise when we try to identify who or what is responsible for these amends. If I steal $1,000 from you, sure, I should return that money back. But what happens if nobody discovers the theft 
for 150 years. At that point, how would we possibly make amends without stealing that money back from somebody with no personal responsibility for it? At that point, these supposed amends are just additional theft, not return of property. Let's think of another example. Let's say there's a murder, but before the killer is brought to trial, he dies in a car accident. In that case, can society ever really make amends to that murder victim's family? If so, how? What would they do? Put somebody else on death row? Because someone's got to pay for the wrong that was done here. Is that justice or is that additional injustice? And Marianne might say, yeah, but we're talking about institutional responsibility, not individual responsibility. And the U.S. government is still alive and well to make amends for its past wrongs. Fair enough. But the difference is I don't see a practical way for the institution to make those amends without wrongly exerting injustice upon the individual. Which brings us to the other half of this knot, the how beyond the why. How these amends can possibly be made in a just way. And I'm not very satisfied with her answers to these questions. Who's paying for this? Everyone? If so, why should a first-generation immigrant be paying for the past sin of slavery, for example? She dodges the question and defers to tax rates for the wealthy and corporate subsidies. I mean, the money has to come from somewhere, right? So, yeah. so the guy who just moved here? The issue is we don't have to tax new people. We need to stop cutting the taxes of the very richest among us. We need to repeal that 2017 tax cut. There was a $2 trillion tax cut that gave 83 cents of every dollar to the very richest earners and corporations. Then you stop these incredible and immoral corporate subsidies. That doesn't answer the question. I'll even grant your point about a progressive tax structure. Why should a wealthy Indian immigrant doctor, for example, be paying a high marginal tax rate for past sins he has nothing to do with? That has no semblance of justice. That's just additional theft. That is just actual theft to pay off hypothetical or possible theft from centuries ago that we can't even specifically demonstrate. There's also the question of who gets paid. Marianne avoids the issue of having to identify individuals by instead planning to pay an institutional investment rather than individual payouts to be distributed by a council of black leaders. What I'm proposing is a, is a council of black leaders, Professor Sandy Darity at Duke University, Tana Hesse Coates. There are many people who have done scholarly work on this subject for a very long time. The stipulation of the US government would be that the money be spent on projects of economic and educational renewal. This distinction also doesn't really address the fundamental question, though. How much personal connection to slavery will be necessary to serve on this council, for example? How much personal connection to slavery will be necessary for these communities that get paid for this renewal? If you don't answer these questions, we end up back at our original problem. It's just special treatment for the Jamaican Indian lady because her skin looks the right color. And then of course you have the question of how much. Marianne says she based her $200 billion figure loosely on the abolition era promise of 40 acres and a mule for freed slaves. But she also says this offer is apparently way under value. Four to five million slaves, or enslaved people, because people are very sensitive about the terminology today, at the end of the Civil War. If every enslaved family of four, formerly enslaved family of four, was given 40 acres and a mule, and you looked at that 40 acres in terms of today's acreage and today's math, it would be trillions of dollars. Okay. What I am proposing is between 200 to 500 billion. Okay, so we're just throwing darts blindly here. There is no real cap. And that's a system that's even more alarming in the context of her saying this so-called justice can only be achieved through government force. It cannot be achieved through voluntary private charity. No amount of private charity can, can compensate for a basic lack of social justice. You can give a million dollars and it's oh so wonderful, but basically because of our tax structure, billions are going to the same situation that makes it so difficult for that person so that just dropping a million dollars into a charity, it helps, but it doesn't in any way change the fundamental pattern. If no check big enough for justice can ever be cut, then how can the government cut it? in your theory. She says the number will be negotiated through this black council. Dave, it's a negotiation like any other. So for instance, a couple of black leaders have said to me, well, but I mean, you know, what if we don't think that's enough? I said, that's what a contract negotiator is all about. You might say, well, that's not enough. We're, we're going to wait. And so then the assumption is, well, would we get more 
10 years, 15 years from now? I don't know. The problem is Marianne has no limiting principle, no measure by which she can quantify this so-called justice. She just defers to this black council because they're academics, but with no pushback or no basis for pushback even, it's just Dr. Evil extortion and we're all on the hook for it. We hold the world ransom for 100 billion dollars. And I think that is the fundamental difference between Marianne and I. If I understand her right, she thinks she can solve this problem without hooking you and I, because this is an institutional rather than an individual problem. You and I aren't guilty or responsible. The government is. And somehow the money to right this wrong will be the government's, not yours or mine. But that's not the way it works. The plurality of the federal government's revenue is income tax. And the bulk of the rest is payroll tax, primarily paid by individual workers. And that's been the government's revenue model only in the post-slavery era, meaning even if the government had an actual savings account instead of a massive credit card debt, none of this money came from anyone who was personally responsible for slavery. Maybe there's some magical yet-to-be-explained plan whereby the government generates its own wealth to pay off its own slavery debt, but unless I'm missing something, that's just not the way government works. Government doesn't make, it only takes. And as explained, that's how Marianne plans to pay for her reparations, by taking through additional taxation. And then you say to, to, to the billionaires in this country, 3%, we get three, the government gets 3%. And you say to those who have 500 million and more, 2% makes sense. If that's the case, the individual and the institution aren't separable at all in the way she describes. The institution is actually dependent on the individual and the core of her argument falls apart. Under that structure, you haven't corrected the injustice. You've just passed it off. If my neighbor gets burglarized and I steal $100 from you to pay him off, that's not justice. That's just theft. So shockingly, I remain unconvinced, but I like to try to be convinced and that's exactly what this detailed exchange with Ruben was. It's worth a listen if you have the time. If nothing else, it's a great example of Dave Rubin not agreeing with that. I agree with that. Love you, Dave. Thanks for a worthwhile interview. And thank you, as always, for listening. Always appreciate that thoughtful discussion down below and especially over on Twitter. That is at ML Christensen. You're always welcome to coming out and chat in my live streams. Those are linked down in the description. Looking forward to it. Goodbye. Okay,